Just a talk, rubbish title. But it's about, it's about working in the digital economy where we're not trading in hardware, but we're trading in, in knowledge, which is valuable. But before we get started, I just wanted to say that all of the advice you've heard today and anything you're going to hear from me is just people telling their stories in their context, in their life. It's not necessarily directly applicable to you, and you've got to use your brains to pick and choose the bits that make sense to you with your values, with your worldview. It's just input. So, we're going to be talking a bit about where I've come from. <coughs> Stuff nobody told me about and probably haven't told you about. And what I would be doing and what I'd focus on if I was entering into this industry today. So I'm going to try and fly through these. <clears throat> so I've been a PHP developer for 16 years. I've been self-employed for seven years and I've run a company for five years. And, uh, you know, web technologies weren't something that were being taught in the late 90s when I was learning them. So I had to learn them by myself. And yeah, I was a garage DJ. You did. Um, so going back in time, I left school in 96. And this is kind of what the world was like in 96. The internet was talked about as the information highway. We had laser discs, didn't have DVDs. And you had really crap phones. But you were lucky if you were able to get a text message sent. So it's very different from today. My first time online was in 97 on AOL, and just for reference, the browser of choice those days was IE3. And uh, I don't know if anyone remembers WAP. Yeah, sorry. Okay. So, you know, th these are the things we take for granted today that were years away back then. I can't imagine living in a world without Wikipedia, but we did. Um, and after this, after 96, I had rubbish jobs, a whole spate of them. And the web wasn't kind of something on my radar. I ended up working in a call center that looked very, very similar to this, doing customer service. And that's how I answered the phone, <laughs> 70 times a day, and sometimes on my own phone after work, because I forgot that I wasn't at work. It was the most depressing job I had, but it was also very important, which I'll touch on a little bit later. And by contrast, the following year, I moved to Paris. After failing to get a job washing dishes, I managed to land a job doing IT support at Budweiser. But I didn't know anything about IT. I just totally blacked it. It was great, actually. I, I was on minimum wage, but part of my salary was two crates of beer every month. It was, it was pretty cool. So my first real exposure to the web came here when I was asked to do their intranet. And... Uh, I was intrigued by the web stuff, but I just didn't really understand it. As an example, you know, if you're on a network, your computer has a name, right? So my computer's name was Kelvin. And I had Microsoft front page set up with this website. And I could point other computers in the office to HTTP, colon, slash, slash, Kelvin, and it would work. So I called up my mum, and I was like, I've just put this website online. Just go to Kelvin in your browser. Obviously, it didn't work. She's like, what are you talking about? I didn't know. I didn't have a clue about how any of this stuff worked. DNS, servers, nothing. But one weekend, I was at home checking my webmail on my state-of-the-art laptop. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw a news story about... I don't know if you, any of you speak French. But it was about how my ISP had began supporting PHP 3. And for some reason, I clicked on it. This is like my sliding doors moment. If I hadn't have seen that, I wouldn't be here today. I, I don't know where I'd be, but I wouldn't be doing this. Now, it hadn't occurred to me that you could do things like put scripts on a server and change the way the page renders. And, but, you know, I found it really interesting. And for some reason, I was hooked. 
So I went to my local bookstore, because, you know, Amazon wasn't a thing. Picked up a book on PHP and MySQL. I downloaded PHP at home. It was a 30 megabyte download. It took eight hours. And I, it was the second time where it, where it succeeded, because it failed after seven hours the first time. I was on a 56K modem for any uh, geeks out there. And soon after, I was able to unleash my first site on the world. Yeah. And that's why I don't design anything. And I'm warning about deadlines. This is, on, this is still online, by the way. There you go. There's a deadline. I actually put on my website that uh, that page will be completed in the year 2000. Anyway, that's it. if you want to have a good laugh, then you can always go to that site. 2001, back to London. Dot com crash happened, there were no jobs. But I managed to harass this company long enough to give me a job, and I would just call them every day. And they wouldn't get back to me, I'd just call them every day. And eventually they're like, oh, for God's sake, all right. So I managed to get a job, and I ended up doing client services. Up until this point, I've been working on a quite, quite a few different products. But over the next few years, the job became very stale. You know, they weren't pushing any new technologies. I wasn't learning. And staying in this job was a bigger risk than not staying in it. So people talk about security, job security. But actually, different types of risks. 2008, the financial crash. My employer was struggling. They couldn't pay my wages on time. So... I decided to start freelancing. Two years after struggling with freelancing, because I was pretty crap at it, I started a company. For some reason, that just worked better for me. I founded it with uh, someone I'd worked with back in the day, and that's what we've been doing since. We're a three-person development company. We build large CMS-driven websites and back-end apps for small companies. That's what we do. Right. Back in 2000 when I was starting, this is what I wish someone had told me. There's most, most of it's most relevant to self-employment, but, but, you know, the gist of it is actually, I think, applicable across the board. First of all, you can work for yourself. I grew up in a working-class family, no entrepreneurialism. It literally did not occur to me until I was about 23. This was a thing that could could happen. I could go out on my own, create my own work, and get people to work for me. It's an option. It's not for everyone, but it's probably for more people than you realise. It took me seven years after having that epiphany to actually make the leap. Employment is as risky as self-employment, but it's just different types of risk. With employment, the destiny is out of your hands. You can be fired You've got less control over your learning, and life generally revolves around your work. With self-employment, it's kind of flipped a bit. But, you know, sometimes there's not enough work, and you've got to be scrappy. You're not sure how much money you're going to make every month. The buck generally stops with you. But work revolves around your life. If you're not happy with how things are going, then you'll need to change them. And to make a change, you need to do something different to what you're doing now, which is uncomfortable. It's the fear of change and how, how you might be... Well, for me, it's the fear, and ch fear of change and how I might be perceived that stops me doing stuff. Like, I get embarrassed about the idea of putting myself out there you know, going out on a limb. I, I get worried about what people I worked with 10 years ago might think about me, which is ridiculous. But, you know, I think a lot of people have the same thing. It is uncomfortable, but good things will come out of that pain if you get beyond that, if you get out of your comfort zone. Sorry. Anyway, it's something I still battle with. But yeah, what is the worst that can happen? 
But in reality, if you go out of your comfort zone and you push yourself and you do these things, actually, people that you're most worried about what they'll be thinking, they'll admire you because they're in the same position as you. You know, they feel the same fear that you fear and they would have done nothing. So they'll admire the fact that you've actually done something. And the people that I know that have gone out and done something, started businesses that looked a bit weird, you know, but eventually got them to work, I admire what they've done. Everyone's a cowboy, right? L literally everyone. No matter how big the company, right, how talented the coder or designer, everyone screws up, everyone makes bad decisions and takes shortcuts, all to try and get stuff done. You know, it's pragmatism. That's, it's, but everyone is a cowboy. You don't need many clients. So we've got about seven or eight clients that give us most of our business. But 80, 90% of our revenue comes from those clients. They're not huge companies. And it's less, once you've got those clients, it's less effort to get work from them than to go out finding new work as well. So, now that we only take on two or three clients a year, the key is to get those clients, keep them. Okay, this is one I could rant on actually for about, for about an hour, but I won't, right? Hourly rates. Charging by the hour, right? If you charge by the hour, you're starting your client relationship off on a wrong foot, right? It creates uncertainty in the mind of the client. You know, okay, but what if things need changing? I have to pay you more? If you're good at what you do, you get paid less because you're quicker. If you're charging by the hour, it's fewer hours. So you get punished. So you get these weird kind of like conflicts of interest. You know, you want to do the best job you can and you should be paid for that. Right, price based on value that you're offering, and it's hard, but you have to understand what that value is. Now, a lot of this is coming from being a freelancer or being a business owner, and so it's not necessarily applicable if you're in employment, right? but it's something just to, to keep in mind. The way I like to think about it is there's a range of pricing. Let's say you're, you're doing a website, right, and you're like, I don't know, 5K. Let's say 5 to 7K. If it was 7K, that would be awesome, right? So you've got this range of, like, tolerance that, that it has, the budget has to come within, and the client has their range, right? And where they cross over, your goal is to get as high up on that crossover as possible, right? And then everyone's happy. You've got to know what your base cost is, though, and that's where kind of hourly rates do come into it. You know, you can't go into a project and think, oh, yeah, that would be great for 5K if it takes you, takes you three months and you're down on money. So you have to understand roughly how much you've got to charge. So I'm going to give you a few, a few figures from my past. Right? When I started out in 2008, 25 quid an hour was how much I was charging. I ended up well, I realized pretty quickly that it was ridiculously low. But, you know, <laughs> the way I calculated it was a bit flawed. Uh, when I was freelancing, 2010, 55 pounds an hour was what I was charging. Should have been higher, if I'm honest, but it worked okay as a freelancer. <laughs> and that's how much I charge our company charges. But we're aiming higher. We're trying to charge more because we think we provide more value than that. So with this pricing tip, the key is comfortable. You're not trying to screw them over. But if people aren't complaining about your price, then you're not charging enough. Right? When I, when I price up a project, this website, I'd go in right at my top end of what I'd be comfortable delivering at, knowing that I'm not screwing them over. 
ideally, they come back to me and say, it's a bit high. And I'm like, good, okay. So I'm, I know I'm now negotiating that level. And we can nudge it down a bit. But if I go in a, a, a lower level that I'm comfortable with, it will get knocked down to an area I'm not comfortable with. And then, again, no one's happy. So we track all of our time at Bright Machine and looked over the last year, and 45% of our time was on billable work. The rest of it was all the other stuff. So when I began freelancing, I thought, oh, it's, this, you know, it's 20 days a month times eight hours a day, you know, divided by what I thought my salary should be, and that's what my hourly rate is. Massively wrong, and you'll end up in trouble with it. Two o'clock every day, so I don't forget to pick up my kids. Um, so, but you, you, as you're starting out, you don't uh, include the costs of like admin and illness and holidays and accountants and all this other stuff that you you realise come with with running a business or being a freelancer. So, um, in 20, 2010, late 2010, I got appendicitis. And it knocked me out of work for a month. But because I was out of work for a month, it meant that I had two months of no work. And that was a pretty difficult time to get through. It was because I hadn't been charging enough. And an FU fund, you, you need to build up savings so that when you get pro projects come to you that you don't like the look of, they're a bit unsavory, you don't have to take them because you need to pay rent. You know? So try and, you try, try and build up a bit of a fund. All right, the learning cycle is weird, it is. Right, as a beginner, solutions are simplistic, often over-designed, so they look okay, but they'll fall apart. It's not an issue if what you're applying your learning to is like ephemeral, and it's going to stick around for a year or something and then go away. But if it's something which is, you know, someone's business, it's going to be, continue to be developed, then it will start to, uh, you know, the wheels will start to fall off. As you learn uh, more advanced concepts, you apply those advanced concepts incorrectly. So the work you, look, you do looks worse than what you were doing as a beginner. You know, I went through this, you know, well, up where, well for about five years, I'd look at work I'd done previously, and i think, why does that look so nice? Why does what I do now look really shit? And it's because of this. And eventually... You, you learn how to better apply those concepts and where not to apply those concepts. And things improve. But then you'll go through the whole cycle on something else. Right, there's one caveat with this. If you're being paid to do R&D on a project, then it's okay to experiment. But if not, it's too risky for your business. So problems will occur once you climb up the learning curve on anything new. We did this on a, on a project relatively recently, and, uh, and it cost us, cost us tens of thousands of pounds. So you still need to learn, so you've got to uh, allocate time for this, like Google does 20% time. We do 20% time internally. It's just stuff where we can mess around and hack on stuff and learn and fail, and it doesn't matter. You know. Okay, I don't know if you've heard this before. Has anyone heard this trope? It's very true. Avoid rewriting an app that's working. You've got to, if you've got an app that's working, it's a legacy app, and you want to improve it, do it incrementally. Um... It's a weird lesson, because I think it's a lesson everyone has to learn by going through. No one can tell you this, so I don't know why I'm telling you. But all I would say is, when you're trying to learn this lesson for yourself for the first time, do it on something small, so that your failure is quite small. Right? I'll give an example, because we learned this on a big project. Still learning it. So we, we built the code of this project over... Over six years, it started off very small and, uh, and slowly grew for this business, this client that we were working for. 
Um, we thought we knew the code base really well, but we were kind of kidding ourselves. You know, things had grown so much over the time that we'd forgotten a lot of stuff, and we didn't realize the complexity involved. Uh, the code hadn't aged well, and the effort that we had to put into making small changes to this was getting larger and larger. Uh, we decided to rewrite the code base because um, what this app that we were building was going to be the foundation of a new business venture, which included us as a kind of shareholder. Um, and, to, and so to support that growth, uh, we wanted, we needed better code under the hood. So we decided to rewrite. That was the budget. Looks like quite a large budget. It was for a six-month project. It was right at the lower end of what we could accept, giving we knew what our costs were. So the first phase of this project was a year late because we went through this whole rewriting thing and we just got into a whole mess. And the finished part of this project, we are aiming to launch in July, so still not totally done. We started this back in late 2013. And that amount is basically work we've done for free on weekends, spare time, you know, subsidized by other project work. So it's a painful lesson, but, you know. Right, clients often uh, come with a technical solution, right? They don't think you need to know the problem. Or sometimes they're not really sure what the problem is themselves. Right, but your job is to figure that out. It's like a doctor. You don't go to a doctor going, uh, oh, this is my ailment. Now, can you just prescribe me this medicine and I'll be on my way? You know, the doctor's the expert. They're there to look at the symptoms and to figure it out. And that's what your job is. So when you figure out the problem, your job is to figure out what the solutions are to those problems and present them in a way that, you know, you, you start building one of those solutions. Right, last part of the talk. So as a former in-house developer turned freelancer, turned business owner, turned employer, this is what I would do if I was in your position about to enter this industry. Right, your, your reputation. Your job is to shape what they say behind your back. Because people will say it, and it's your job to actually think about it. And what do you want people to say behind your back? Taking care of your reputation will lead to good things. Better jobs, better clients, better pay. These are all the different kind of questions I might ask myself. But it's up to you to figure out what's important to you. You know, what's your world for you? Who do you want to work for? What do you want them to think about you? What kind of worker are you? What type of work do you do? But you've got to look out for yourself. Because no one else will. You know? You'll go and join a company, and a good company will try and look out for you. right? But if they've lost a massive project, and they need to downsize, it's going to be you who's out on your ear. Right? So you've got to prepare for that, and you've got to look after yourself. Right? Your skills, a lot of what PJ said, I agree with. You know, this stuff is important. And not like that. That's not how you communicate. Or like that. More like this. You solve people problems first, right? So anecdotally, I would say 90% of people are crap at communicating, right? And you want to find yourself in that 10%, and you're going to have to work at it. In many fields, like being a clear communicator is a differentiator, right? Like doctors and teachers, the best doctors and the best teachers are the ones that communicate clearly. They're not the ones who you know, who prescribed the medicine the best. That awful job centre job, the call centre job I had, 
when I was 17. That's where I learned how to communicate with people. And I got comfortable with it. And it was okay. I was talking to people 70 times a day, 70 different people. And I, understood, you know, I got comfortable with it. So it's, not, it's not awful. It's not as bad as you might think going into it. You know? That's why it was one of the most important jobs I had, even if it was, if it was just a really shit job. But whatever job, if you go out looking for a job and you get a job, whatever type of job you, you get, look for the stuff in those jobs that you can learn, learn from, learn not what to do, you know? So in this world that we live in, give people more information that they need, right? In a knowledge-based economy, it creates distance in space and in time. So, because you're not working in an office, right, all this communication is like asynchronous. Right? People might not see your message, the messages you send straight away. They might see them in an hour's time, even if you're working at the same time. So you've just got to consider that and over-communicate so everyone knows what page you're on. You know? So just be mindful of it as you go about, about your business. Right, this is a really important one really important, but it's something you can experiment with. Right, what does it mean? How you position yourself depends on whether you're going to be looking for a job or whether you're going to be self-employed. Right? Let's look at what it might look like if you're looking for a job. So who thinks this is a decent way of describing yourself? No one? Come on. We all describe ourselves like this at the beginning. You think, yeah, that's kind of what I do. Okay. But which company is looking for that? You could say any company. Any company who works on the web looks for that. But anyone is really close to no one. It's too broad. How about that? Is that better? It's a bit better. What about that? Getting a little bit more specific. The more specific you get, the more you can start to picture companies that might be looking for this kind of talent. And those companies will take more notice of you if you're talking about yourself in these terms. So it's up to you what you want to figure, figure out what you want to be and the types of clients or companies you want to work for but the benefits are huge in figuring out how to position yourself, what do you enjoy doing, and how you want to put that across. Right, don't try to stand out from the crowd. Avoid crowds altogether. Realistically, it's unlikely that any of us are going to be the best in the world at what we do, right? But the world is a really big place, right? If that's, your, if that's the kind of market you're looking at, that's a, it's a big market, it's the biggest one there is. So you've got to look at shrinking that market, you know? And that's where positioning comes into it. Try and create a small market and then be the best in that. You're able to uh, learn more deeply because so it's easy to understand where you need to focus your learning and it's easier to become an expert. So take this guy, uh, Chris, Chris Coyer, CSS Tricks. He founded this site nine years ago. And it wasn't groundbreaking content he was putting out. Straightforward content. Right? But over time of constantly putting out this content, he became known as the CSS guy. This is the guy you go to to learn about CSS. Three years ago, he raised 90, 90 grand on Kickstarter to do a redesign of his site because he'd built up this reputation. You know? So you can focus on one thing, learn deeply about it, and then move on if you get bored. doesn't matter. You can try different things, different contexts. Chris Coyer, again, so he started CSS Tricks, but then he went and uh, did, what was that, code, code pen, codepen.io. You know, he founded that. And now he's built up a team that runs CSS Tricks as he's moved on. Right. 
take ownership. This is, this is the last, last section, right? It's very important, and a lot of it links back to what PJ was saying. You have to know what you're comfortable doing and who for, or for whom, I should say, I suppose. This is a creative industry, and what you make will impact on the world. Right? Steve Jobs quote. Show up, learn, make progress. Coming back to confidence. Right? Even the most seasoned developer has imposter syndrome. I think it's only the really super naive and people who don't have a clue of how much they don't know that don't really have imposter syndrome. The more you learn, the more you worry about what you don't know. So in this world of um, social media and self-publishing, everyone is putting out images of the way they wish to be portrayed. Right? But it's not the reality. Everyone has the same doubts as you. So have confidence. Don't judge yourself on how other people are uh, putting themselves out there because they have, they have the same crap underneath. So you, you see, this is my, my favourite... Well, this is from... Um, sorry. Gaping, Gaping Void, Hugh McLeod's book. Right in the top left... Sing in your own voice. I think that's something that sticks in my head so many times. Be true to yourself and don't be a cheap imitation. Kind of comes back to advice. You get all this advice and you've got to pick it out. What rings true with you? And this is a slide I nicked from Andy. Okay. These are all the images I use, most of it from gapingvoid.com, a bunch of other stuff. Thank you. We've got a question, so. How was that in terms of time? Yeah. Sorry, a bit late? No, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. It's not a comment, but I'm glad you, you raised uh, your job the call centre. Yeah. Yep. But actually, you know, I'm, I'm similar to you. I see with a merchandiser in retail, right. and a lot of what I do with design and now actually stems from stuff I used to do in my old job, which was all like detail oriented. So I'm just glad you mentioned that because I think it's especially with a degree in web, which is really tempting to focus purely on that, but it's not in the world you ended up working in a different industry. Yeah. So some core skills before you went to actually just buy yeah. Yeah, it was extremely valuable. And um, like I think Zaid said, what are the red flags if you're employing someone? What are the red flags that, that stop you employing someone? Sure. For me, because employing people is hard. You know, you've got to actually figure out what makes them tick, what skills they have and all this. But actually, the communication is, is what it comes down to. If they're comfortable talking and they're clear in what they say and the messages they put over, chances are they learn well, you know, they're comfortable, they're quite confident, and whatever you need them to do, they can turn their attention to, you know. So communication, I think, for me, is like the clear, the clear red flag. If someone's, like, not speaking clearly or, like, looking a bit shifty and a bit weird, then that's, that gets me a bit nervous. And when I get nervous, I don't employ people. Shifty, shifty little eyes. Anything else? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not. Did you Did you notice that website that I put up? I could go back to it if you want. The one with the neon. Yeah, I can't design to save my life. I'm using Dexet, which is an app which gives you lots of really nice themes. So no idea. Yeah. That's not super, it's not superficial, it's, yeah. Again, that's communication, isn't it? Anything else?
Thank you very much. Cheers.